Hello, everyone. So before I share my story with you today, I want to ask you guys a question. How many of you guys among the audience here love science? Can I see a raise of hand? Good, good. I love science myself. My name is Kia. I'm a PhD candidate in bioengineering. It's because of my passion in science that really brought me to America about 10 years ago to really pursue my dream. So, for a lot of measures, we are at the golden age of biomedical sciences. Through the discovery of biomedical sciences, now we are able to prevent, control, or even cure the most deadly diseases. With the development of vaccines such as the polio vaccines, to the decoding and complete sequencing of human genome and the discovery of stem cells, now we are talking about the potential to create a new human organs and even personalized medicine. You, as the American public, should be very proud of this achievement because of your generosity in funding through the National Institute of Health that has made this work possible. So let me ask you another question. What do you think is the other driving force of biomedical research? It's actually people like you and me, the very fearless, aspiring trainees that are really making the changes, doing experiments day and night, trying to come up with the next cure for diabetes, heart research, or cancer. It is us that has been received trainings from the day one in our graduate training to conduct research in an academic career with the hope that we can become the next generation of independent scientists to conduct our research. However, oh, if you guys don't recognize, that's me in the, on the second there. Okay, however, the reality is not really that right. So we as scientists, we love data. So let's look at some of the data. So this data is telling us that for every seven PhDs that are awarded in science and engineering, only one of them, only one, only one opening in faculty position. That means for every seven PhDs, there's only one position available for them to enter academic training, and which is the academic career, the only training that ha they, have been, they have been received from the day one since they entered graduate school. So what happens to the other six? What are they going to do? Are they prepared enough? Are they well informed to enter non-academic career? So conventional wisdom tell us in this imbalanced system, usually the whole system will rebalance itself and try to you know, balance the supply and demand. However, the biomedical research really doesn't respond to the classic market forces for two reasons. One, we still are, re we still are experiencing a large influx of graduate applicants coming from foreign countries. So due to the better prospect of the United States than the home country. Secondly, there's also this notion of passionate people like myself wanting to cure diabetes, or you're really passionate about science, when they enter the first day of grad school, they don't really think about future career opportunities. They just want to cure diabetes. So with that in mind, so we still know that the other six, you know, very sadly, they won't make it to academic career. So what are they going to do? What are some of the pathways to get into non-academic career? So I took a look at this. It's actually very different hiring criteria and requirement than academic career. So some of the hiring criteria that is very emphasized uh, upon from this uh, employer is that the skill sets of project management, leadership, communication, teamwork, these skill sets are very underdeveloped in our graduate training. And also, employers value real-world experience. Sadly, in our graduate training, we are not being exposed to all this experience. So to reflect the realities of the job market, graduate students really need to try to diversify their training and also get exposure to real-world experience. Secondly, also we want to look at, with this career advancement in non-academic career, some of the things that they've done, will this, like the training that we provide currently, will this really translate to their future career advancement? 
So gladly, I'm not the only one that knows that this is an issue and this is a problem. Some of the government effort that is putting into with the goal of broadening the prospect of young scientists, we, for example, NIH and NSF, they realize that this is a big problem as well. So there are funding opportunities given by these two funding agencies that goes into U.S. institution with the goal to help the institution to develop innovative programs to come up with, uh, to equip students with more career skills while they are still in graduate training. Another example is coming from AAAS that offers a fellowship opportunity for one year to work in DC, Washington, DC, in science and policy while they are still in graduate training before they enter the job market as well. So my question is that these are all top-down approach that we've seen coming from the government. My question is that is there anything we can do our part as a trainee to complement with this solution, to make it a more robust solution to tackle this big problem. So over the past year, a couple of friends and I have been discussing about this problem, and we have been talking about what are the, some of the things that we can do as trainees. And actually a couple of friends of mine are actually in the audience as well today. So we, we decided that recognizing that we need hands-on training and also recognizing that Pittsburgh has a very vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem, we decide to form a nonprofit student organization called Fourth River Solutions. Fourth River Solution is a student-driven nonprofit consulting organization with two missions. The first is to educate our members and students about non-academic career opportunities. Secondly, we also want to provide our members with experiential learning opportunities to explore the business side of science. So with these two missions in mind, it's basically a very simple concept. We wanted to create a bridge between academia and industry. So we want to provide an avenue for our graduate students to learn more about the concept of, of business while exploring some of the early stage innovation. So on one side, we have these graduate students that are very experienced hungry. They're just eager to learn everything you know, that's outside of academic career opportunities. On the other side, as I mentioned earlier, we also have this very vibrant local entrepreneurial community in Pittsburgh that needed some help as well. So why don't we connect these two? You know, teams of graduate students, they can go to provide problem-solving support in the form of doing market research, competitive analysis, or technology due diligence to help the growth and of these uh, start early startup companies. And actually, we did that. And then, um, actually, this model worked pretty well for two reasons. One is because we are all scientists. We are very well-versed and we're really expert in the science and technology. So that makes us easier to understand our client's technology. Secondly, also because of our very rigorous graduate training, we are often very good at applying hypothesis-driven approach and also very analytical approach to, to give a very objective recommendation towards our client's problem. And this worked pretty well, and most of these clients, actually, a lot of these clients appreciate our, our, our effort. And also being geographically located in this vibrant ecosystem make us uh, uh, very busy. A lot of clients actually came to us, you know, after a couple of projects, people just spread out good news, about, good words about us. So maybe some of you guys know, City of Pittsburgh, in the past year, they have attracted about $338 million of investment funding from venture capital, angel investment, and other funding sources. That represents a 34% increase over the past, over, over four years. Internally, at the University of Pittsburgh, there are about 155 technologies that are being licensed. And that makes uh, about 70% increase compared to the previous year. So for us as Fall River Solution, in the past 11 months, we have done four, we have involved with four companies in, uh, with the star communities in the city of Pittsburgh and also seven te technologies at the University of Pittsburgh to help with this early stage innovation companies and technologies. 
with our involvement and with our consulting engagement, we are able to help our client to redefine their research and development focus, to reformulate their business plan, also to devise a market uh, entry strategy for them. And this only happens in the past 11 months. Finally, most importantly, coming back to the career development impact, which is the most important goal we set out to do when we form Fourth River Solutions. What do we, we want to see how did we do? How did we, did we help really help our students? So one of the most prominent examples I want to share with you guys today is that we have created a very high visibility among the hiring, for the hiring from the top tier consulting firms. That number has increased from what one job candidate being invited from interview to the recent 15 candidates that we have seen receive interviews from top tier consulting firms. That number, that huge spike makes Pitt the third largest recruitment school among 17 other schools in the whole Midwest region. Me, myself, being in Pitt, I'm very proud of that. Hail to Pitt. That was a huge increase among 17 other Midwest schools. So not just interviews, we also want to see whether this really secure real jobs. So from the more recent graduate alumni that we've seen, all of them actually landed non-academic career. So one of them actually become the consultant in this top tier consulting firm. Another one secure a senior research associate job in New York City in the executive search firm. And more recently, a friend of mine just received an offer in Minnesota in a uh, medical device company. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. Among the 15 interviewees that received you know, uh, interview with this top tier consulting firm, almost all of them directly involved or directly or indirectly involved with Fourth River Solutions. So overall, I, want to, I hope that I can leave you with one message today. I believe a research and education system as robust and productive as ours can correct its vulnerabilities in some ways eventually. However, the change needs to come from multiple levels, a top-down and a bottom-up approach. We are all learning by doing. The most important thing is doing. So let us do our part as students to drive change from bottom up, to restore the environment so that in which talented scientists and trainees can do their best work. Thank you. <laughs>